So think of this as kind of a conceptual briefing, not a housing briefing, but explain how CAM CAM or CAD CAM is into the world of uh, engine machining. Well, as, as I said, just give it a, uh, a club and overview. I call it a primer. Uh, and the things to talk about, why it's interesting, uh, and what I think the difference between CAD and CAM is. Uh, and then recognize that uh, CAM is both additive and subtractive manufacturing, which is kind of new for this century. Uh, and then some resources if you want to get further, okay? So let's go ahead and figure out how to make this thing work. Okay, so uh, I think that CAD is something we all ought to consider, whether or not you're ever getting into uh, CAM machining or not. Uh, it's a good tool for drawing, it's handy for creating your own tool path if you're cranking the a knob on your rotary table, uh, and there's a, a lot of benefits if you're into I'm hoping to give people some concepts of is uh, what do you need to think about if you're going to get into the business? So what are your requirements and what are your needs? And that was the toughest part for me starting up because I wasn't educated enough to make informed judgments. So what do you need? How much can you afford? Maybe where are you going with this? And a good example is if you were shopping for a 3D printer, do you want one or two nozzles? What difference does it make? And it's a big convenience if you get there. Maybe it's not important if you want to just get your feet wet. The other thing that's a big feature is the learning curve on how to handle a big software package. And we'll talk about that a little bit uh, as well. Okay. I happen to have taken classes at the ANZA on SOLIDWORKS and MasterCAM. I'll use those as examples, but I'm trying to keep this briefing independent of a particular software application. Mike, Mike mentioned the difference between CAD, which is just really a drafting replacement, and it's you know, coming up. Oh, drafting versus CAD. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great minds think alike. <laughs> Once upon a time, in the middle of the 20th century, he took mechanical drawing in high school, okay? and you, you had a T-square and triangles and French curves and compasses and dividers and a scale to physically lay out on the graphic tape. Uh, and what you were producing is drawings, and the classic were three views, and you could write isometric drawings, maybe sectional views, and you would physically letter the dimensions on the device, and if it was the final exam, you got to ink it with the pan in the ass. You used an eyedropper to put the ink in these little subscribers to the best goals in the computer revolution is between high capacity CPU processors, more mass storage, and all the graphics interfaces. You get some really nice <coughs> program interfaces to do a lot of things. And the big difference in my mind is now a CAD program creates a solid model. And we'll talk about what that means as opposed to just a drawing on two dimensions. Okay? So computer-aided design versus computer-aided drafting. Okay, so we said drafting produces a 2D drawing set. What I think the essential features are of a CAD program is you do the 3D modeling and you also can do parametric modeling. And there's really kind of two definitions of parametric in my mind. One is you can use it to generate equations for lines or surfaces. And the other is you can set up the drawing so it automatically scales by just changing a dimension. And I'll have an example coming up to show how that works. Now, why does solid work cost $2,000 a year or whatever it is for a seat life? Because it's got all this other stuff that is focused principally on industry needs, high production, those kinds of things. So what can it do in addition to make it wrong? It's got features for material properties and strength of materials. It can do kinematic modeling, dynamic modeling. Uh, it can lay out a sheet metal part with the bend allowances. It can lay out a uh, plug for a, a foundry that has the, the tapers for your 
um, your forms. Uh, it can do uh, PCB layouts. You can have a whole slew of different file formats to make it interoperable with other applications. And then there's some other fancy stuff. You can do uh, sexy colors. You can do uh, image rendering with various white features and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of stuff. And when you look at the specs for a package, does any of this stuff appeal to you or not? Uh, maybe it doesn't. So a very modest system could meet your needs. But this is what you get at the high end. Okay, so we talk about solid models. And I thought it'd be worthwhile to spend a few minutes talking about that because a solid model is a 3D depiction in software of a part. Okay, so it's got the surface features and whatever internal features there are as well. And when you build that solid model, the dimensions are inherent in it. So when you used to have a dimension drawing to tell you how to build a part, now you just get a file loaded into your CAM software, and that's enough to generate the tool pass. So that would be an old traditional drawing, two or three views. This is a wireframe depiction, which is one convenient way to depict the, the um, solid model, because you see the edges, and you can pick out that line as the cut-to line for building a tool path when you're in the can. Okay? And then it's really handy to have that because when you get into the, let's see, where I just found a couple of images on the website. These are solid models. And you can see that, that there's some sort of mathematical mesh of triangles to define those surfaces. And that's what the programs are using either for the cam for a, a tool path to, on a mill or the slicer on your uh, additive manufacturing to build a tool path in 3D printing. No, those are SDL models. Say again? Those look like STL models. STL. S. San. T. San. Tom. It's, it's a surface only model. Uh, made out of little triangles, and that's for additive. You wouldn't use that, although you could reverse that, but uh, that's not as precise as you need for, for driving your CNC mill or lathe. You're going to use the mathematical equations uh, and parameters to do sure. that. These are the image of the, you're right, okay? And so if you were using your CAM program, these geometries you could use to set up a linear pattern of tech drills or whatever you're doing to create those particular features. Okay. okay, so file formats, this is just what comes up when you say save as in SOLIDWORKS. And there's a whole bunch of different files. Many of them are native to SOLIDWORKS for parts, assemblies, or drawings. Others are the industry standards for solid models, which come in a variety of formats. And a whole bunch of them are to be compatible with other software applications. For example, they got Photoshop and Illustrator, which are graphic design tools. So you can import stuff into your uh, CAM program if you're, or your CAD program if you're interested. OK, so uh, I'm just going to give a couple of examples of of parametric activities. So I'm using a little Turner's cube as an example. And the um, parametric size I set up so that the counterbores have a recursive mathematical relationship. That means that they're each proportionally smaller. It was interesting if you do some internet search, there's a lot of people that have posted Turner's cubes that they just kind of pulled it out of their ear and it looks okay, but it doesn't scale particularly nicely. Okay. And so uh, one way is to just pick a dimension and make all the rest of them relative. So you change the, the cube size and the drawing automatically grows or uh, shrinks. And then you can fit the number of counterboards. And that just happens to be the way you would capture those dimensions in SolarWorks, but it's 
it looks a lot harder than it is because then you just draw one, you make a relative dimension, and it gets captured by the program. Okay? So now think about equation driven curves. This is a shot of a gear. Okay? And so the way you construct gears are to lay out the construction geometry, which is uh, as indicated, and you can get everything laid out until you draw this little grip right there, which is the end loop curve. Okay, so a world class CAD program now can let you put in a parametric equation so you get the exact envelope uh, shape. And then We'll talk about the geometric features in a second, but basically what you do is you just use this as a cut profile to cut one slot in the gear, propagate that slot all the way around, and you get the full uh, tooth form. Okay, so how to use a CAD program? High level conceptually, have a plan, and the way you implement it is you choose a plane, you create a dimension sketch, that has to do with some particular geometry. And then if it's a 3D modeler, you can do what's called an extrude. You just stretch that sketch out some dimension and you create a solid object. Once you've got that piece of stock then, you make successive loops through to create another feature, whether it's to cut a profile or cut a hole or extrude a boss on it, and then add those features successively, and essentially it's a kind of a reverse order of what you do to act the machine that part. So going through a couple of examples, think about this little cube. And so what you're doing is essentially making those counterbores successively. Okay? So you start with a sketch, and software programs have a sketch menu. And this is just an illustrative one, but basically, what you do is you say, I want to start a sketch, and you have these sketch tools to draw lines or circles or ellipses or polygons or whatever. You've got some fancier things to let you generate uh, offset lines or propagate the features around the geometries. And so once you're done with the uh, sketch, you can essentially build a square for a, a cube. And then you go to the next thing, which is extrude the stock, and then you have a different feature. So instead of going from sketch, you put the feature, and you can extrude, you can cut, you can generate the solid features through a lot of uh, different ways. And as you get smarter, you find quicker and easier ways to do it. So if you think about that Turner's cube, the simple way, when you extrude, you now have a, a cube. And so, to create the rest of the features, again, you come up with a strategy. There's a simple way to do it, which is essentially just make successive bores each way, do it six times on each face, and so that would be literally the way you would do it if you were a machiner. But if you've got a fancy CAD program, you can use some of the features of the program. So that's just a sketch of taking successive bores on one particular face of the system. <clears throat> and you can see that it keeps track of the individual bores, SOLIDWORKS calls them features. So then what you could do is take advantage of some of the feature propagation and essentially rotate that set of features around the x-axis and now you've got four faces cut. Do the same thing around the z-axis, and you've got all eight. Six. Right, all six. You can do eight. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <Hi -hand. laughs> and so we were, you know, having some sidebar discussions about how using this feature can uh, can make the drawing a lot slicker. Okay. Uh, so. Once you've got the solid model, then you've got to decide whether you actually need a drawing or not. If you're passing the solid model off to a CAM program, you don't need it. If you, for some reason, 
want a fancy drawing, like you're publishing a magazine, then you use the drawing function that exports the solid model and its inherent dimensions into the drawing program, and then you go through the, the drafting analog steps to actually put in the dimensions and uh, choose which views you want, what you need section of view, drive the metrics for all that sort of thing. And so that's just an example of how to solve it. Keeps you out of trouble. Because once you once you define the solid model, by definition you get essentially perfect 2D, including cross sections or anything else you want. And if you had to do that in something like a sketch program like AutoCAD, that's basically a digital version of a pencil and paper. That's right. So this this is about ten times faster than drawing it in AutoCAD. And when you cut that thing. You start with a small hole first and come out, and then you start with a big hole and go in. In the drafting world, it's arbitrary. Okay, You could start at the top surface and cut down, or you could start at the bottom and work up. Or if you're really slick, you're smart enough to say, I'll draw it on the center plane, and I'll cut up to two surfaces through the whole thing, so there's a lot of flexibility in the actual feature generation depending upon the particular software. I think the question was how would you fabricate that? Would you start with the small hole and work your way out? If you had to fabricate that, would you start with the center hole and then work your way out? If you start with the big hole, then the thing will come apart and you can't okay. see it. <laughs> when I cut it, you made one. Okay, on a CNC, I chose to drill through first so I didn't have to do a plunge cut. Okay. So that I would start the tool path for each of the counter bore through the hole that I cut through in the beginning and that would kind so of you do all the counter bores on one side and roll it. And then all the counter yeah. bores on the next side. Yeah. And then what happened the last one they, they just fall off? Did it come loose? No, the last? It's actually connected. They stay connected. Okay. So okay. so this particular model they're all connected. All right. Okay. If you chose one where they weren't, you need to have some of that you know, soluble casting material to hold yeah. for the final step. One of the nice features about the solid works on maybe Alfred or Libre does the same thing from that I've looked into it, is if you want to change something, you go ahead and you make the change on your solid model or in your sketch in the drawing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, when you make a drawing model, model yeah, well, everybody, yeah, once you okay. change the model, of the drawing yeah. changes yeah. automatically. So what you can see is you have that uh, menu of features. Yeah. You can go back and open up the feature. Right. Open up the sketch yeah. that that was generated. It makes a change. But yeah, what I'm saying is it changes the model and then changes the... That's the right. It changes a lot of that change. Yeah. But there's a caution, you can easily make a change that will break the model. Right. Okay, because it's no longer logically consistent. Okay, experience that. So, uh, look over there. I guess the, the other thing I want to make a point here is that, at least in SOLIDWORKS terminology, and I think it's pretty common, uh, part of the spider appears. You guys shut up. Hey, talking straight. You too. Uh, you put parts together into assemblies. Uh, the output, as I say, can either be a solid model or a file. Uh, and then you can easily make a whole set of assemblies. And I stole this from one of Mike's drawings, where you see each one of those is a different view of the assembly of the little engine with all of the parts put together with some sort of mating. Uh, and you could also choose an expanded view where you disconnect all those things and see them stretched out. Well, I like sexy it. feature. Yeah, that's more difficult okay. to make it look good. An exploded view. Mm -hmm. like okay, it. so now let's shift gears a little bit. Again, first principles on CAD as I understand it, or CAM as I understand it. So obviously these days there's two choices. Are you in a subtractive world or an additive world? And subtractive mills and lanes are what we normally think of, but there's a whole bunch of other CNC controlled devices, usually 2D, 2D, like a router or a laser cutter or a water jet or a EDM kind of thing. But essentially, what you're doing 
is creating a software program to tell whatever the cutter is, the path that ought to be on to remove the material. Additive is the opposite direction, okay? And the biggest part, or biggest challenge I had with additive manufacturing is keeping track of all those acronyms that are, some of them are process descriptions and some of them are marketing names sort of thing. But essentially, additive manufacturing first principle works on adding solid material, like those reels of thermal setting plastic. It works on liquid, which is often some sort of resin that you selectively harden spots of it using things like a laser. And then the third class is powders, which essentially you would sweep a layer of powder, again using something like a laser to selectively harden pieces of it, lower the build thing, sweep another layer of raw powder, and you keep building it up for it. So depending upon the geometry, you may need not only build material, but support material if you're building an arc. Okay? Uh, and so the, the mechanisms are all common in that they somehow turn the build material into a solid object uh, with either hardening fluids or irradiating somehow the powder or the resin kind of thing. There's also, I think, some can we don't think about. So Google sometimes automated manufacturing and see in the production line in an auto plant these articulated arms that are doing spot welds kind of stuff. Uh, probably not what we're going to put in our garage. They, they have now right. taken a robot arm, given it a big welder, and built a bridge doing that that's going to go over a canal in, in Holland. So. <laughs> Both the job lost. Plus all the rooms. I threw in a pop quiz on all the acronyms, but I figured nobody else would remember me better than I did. So these are the kinds of the terms that come out of it. Uh, Ed and I took a class, what, a year ago, two years ago, whatever it was, that was a survey of all these things. And it's it's a evolving technology, you know, people trying to figure out what can be done, whether they can make a business case that closes. But what we're starting to see now is big industrial manufacturing going to additive manufacturing for things like jet engine parts that save assemblies. Uh, and uh, the guys who teach this are all marketeers. So there's perhaps uh, overselling it a little bit. Mike, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> you see, uh, BMW has now, now said they, in the last 10 years, they've printed 10, uh, 1 million parts for the cars. So they're using this in production. Okay. One of the, the challenges to additive that occurs to me is that if you have a material specified, and you cut it out of 6061, regardless of how you cut it, you kind of have a good feel for what the strength of material to the article is. It's not true with additive because you don't know by looking at the part what the internal structure is. And I don't know that they've yet evolved standards for how to structure that internal um, material behavior so you get the expected. It's a little okay. okay. And if you're building uh, car upholstery, or interior accoutrements, it probably doesn't make any difference. If you're building jet engine parts, it probably does. Kind of so that's something I think that the technology is going to going to mature with. Okay, big picture of process. If you're subtractive, you're building a tool path for a mill or a lathe. You start with a solid model. You might use a wireframe to select a geometry. Typically, you hold the cutter in the spindle and you move the part around. Okay, the tool pads are where you go to remove the stock and you could be doing all the classic cuts that you do on a manual mill. <coughs> Facing your profiles, cutting a surface, drilling a hole, uh, whatever kind of thing. Uh, but in the cam world, the machines could be 2D, 3D, or uh, higher than that. Uh, and we'll talk about that in just a second. 
The common convention is called G code, which is a standard set of instructions that essentially set the expectations for the movement. And so you can do it rapid or slow. You have a full set of cutting um, movements that typically uh, synchronize with the feed rate and the RPM of the cutter. Uh, you use the M codes for things like configuration, turning coolant on and off, and those sorts of things. Okay. Um, and in the cam world, particularly as you get above 2 or 3D, fixtures and fixture deconflicting is a big deal, so you don't drive your cutter through the fixture. And in fact, a lot of the high-end cam have you simulate the fixture along with the part when you're actually coming up with the cutting. Yeah, well, I've been around some of that, and the guys will get the fixtures and they oh, the cutter's going to hit here, so I tell them, no, you can't do that. Very helpful. Okay. That's why cam costs a much more than cam. Yeah. Okay, so I thought I'd expand a little bit about mobile axis. If you just think about it, you've got mechanics, you've got six degrees of feet, three translation and three rotation, and so theoretically you could adjust in those degrees of freedom as you're presenting the work to the cutter. And this was a, a quick search. This is for a, a horizontal milling center and a vertical milling center, and there's some conventions about what you use uh, as what axis sort of thing. Uh, I think I got some uh, examples. Probably the most common example is just mechanizing your rotary table. And if you do that on a mill, now you can essentially drill features as you rotate a rod. If you think about it though, one project I'm entertaining is, is automating my rotary table so I can cut gears and I don't need to have automation on the rest of the table. That's a convenient step to save cranking the uh, oh, table. Oh boy. Okay. Yeah. So the, uh, the other examples I came up with, this is a snapshot of Peter's uh, cam grinding machine that he's going to cut them out before he grinds them. Uh, this is a really interesting one I found on a Russian website. And if you look at it carefully, it looks like this is the, the motion of the cutter in an X, Y, and Z. And then he's got at least two axes of rotation uh, in the bottom of the thing. So that's three, four, or five degrees of freedom. I've seen whole, three or four of those German machines that do that. The scary thing maybe is that you now for under two grand could buy a five axis CNC, a small one. Yeah. Uh, a lot of them are the routers. Yeah. And I mean, they're five axis. I program those. It costs you a lot more for the cam than it does the, the machine. And yeah, something like that here. Your working table is very small. Yeah. It's well, and, and I threw this one in because if you look carefully, you discover that all that multi axis is done in the cutter spindle. Not in the, the work. So is that bottom one, is that a gantry? Yeah. Is that called a gantry? That's called a gantry then. Yeah, yeah that's CMC yeah. Rogers. Yeah. And, and the whole area I haven't even tried to talk about is all the, how to describe it. There's a whole bunch of other machines that only do one function, cut screws or thread bolts or whatever it is sort of thing, but for, for high rate production. Okay. So moving into printing, same kind of process over you. You start with a solid model. Big difference, of course, I think in, in additive manufacturing is you've got to have a cam analog to do this slicing. So basically what it's doing is it's excessively looking through the material or through the part depiction, deciding where there is material and where there's not, because then it's got to feed back into whatever you call the analog of a solid or a 3D printer tool path to know when to either turn the laser on or not, or the electronic discharge, electron discharge, whatever it is, kind of thing. So typically, you just sweep off the, <coughs> the whole tool path, turning it on and off, okay? And then the, the speed of how fast it can go depends a little bit on how much material you're depositing on each spot and then how many spots you have to, uh, to fill. Okay, we talked about multiple uh, nozzles. 
one way is you could have build material in one and, and uh, support in another. Um, so you uh, build the, the layers in successive steps. The strategy kind of depends on the technology. So if you're doing a extruder that's depositing thermosetting plastic, you start in the bottom and you work up. Okay. And so well, you start right. flat on the back. And so you're just sweeping back and forth. Now, if you're using one of the stereolithography, which essentially is your build is a pool of resin, and essentially what you would do is you'd illuminate it from the bottom and then lift it up and successively build the layers as you go this way. So there's a lot of different ways to skin the cat to uh, go through this process. So I think I just put a couple of examples here. This one was a, a FDM extruder. This one is one of those uh, resin gadgets. This is another uh, SLA. And you can see this is the pool of resin. And it's essentially lifting that complex shape out of it as it progressively goes. So it works from the top down. Pardon? It's no. Nice. It's the top down? Bottom up. Bottom up. Uh, it's not showing it correctly. <laughs> it's showing it. It's less would start. Like this, and then slowly raise it to build it like that. No, no. I've seen it. Well, yeah, they have some, yeah, but nice. but the, the they're going towards the ones that have a window on the bottom. Oh, really? And actually, they're going to LCDs now. Okay. You can now buy these things for under two so, grand. So it turns out there are competing technologies. Okay. And I think is this particular one just has a thin layer of resin that it keeps replenishing as the the part is literally raised up out of the, there are other techniques that they have a big uh, tub of the resin and you can operate it in a different direction. One of the first ones had a tub of resin which had three axis lasers and this was thermoset resin. So when all three beams hit at the same point, that part set. So you just drew the part in the resin and then drain the resin out. There's your part set. And so that one of the advantages of doing it that way is you don't need the, the support material if you're building complex shapes because it's all suspended in the, the resin until you're all done. <laughs> okay, so kind of some observations from my perspective. Uh, for CAD software, the principles are pretty much the same, although feature enhancements may vary from product to product. Uh, and how fancy the feature set are drives the cost. There's lots of choices out there. Um, try one you might like it, okay? The CAM software, particularly subtractive, uh, I guess the first thing to remember is you don't need a CAM to cut CNC subtractive. You can, if you're smart enough, you can sketch the G code instruction by instruction, type it up with a text editor and make it cut. In the very first class at the end, so that's the way they had to do it. You're, you're manually coding it, and it's a good background to understand how G-code works. Trouble is, you quickly get parts that need more instructions than you could possibly ever manually create, so that's why the, the CAM software is, is so attractive. Um, the, Automated features of what you're paying for with a big CAM uh, program. Some of them have a whole wide variety of tool path suites, particularly when you get into four or five dimension, or five multi axis uh, programming. Uh, that's a very complicated process to go through and product, produce tool paths that actually work. Uh, some of them bundle CAD with the CAM program. So MasterCAM, once upon a time, you could start with a little sketch program and build your solid model. And in fact, when N and I started, however long ago it was, that was what the course did. You started with a 2D drawing, you built the model, and then you built the tool pack. Nowadays, the more common practice is, here's a solid model, just focus on the cool path if you're doing CAM. Uh, one of the other things to be aware of is there's this world called post-processing. 
So you can essentially build a model or import a model, create a toolpath set that gets what you want to do, but it's kind of generic. So there's a set of platform specific instructions, whether you're using Haas or Fidal or whatever, that says this is how you turn the machine on, this is how you initially configure it, this is how you drive the spindle to the home position, this is how you set up work control or work uh, frames, this is how you handle cutter compensation or what sort of stuff. So it's just again something to be aware of if you're actually thinking about yeah. camp. Also that post-processor to generate the NC program can be quite expensive too. Yep. Just as much as the camps. Yep. Or mm -hmm. more. I think even more. Yeah. Even more. Five axis post-processor is probably five grand. Uh, oh, okay. here. Yeah. yeah, I think yeah. just yeah. On, on the additive cam, uh, it's very much more specific to a particular manufacturer's technology, I think. There's no industry standards. There's no set of post-processors. If you buy a 3D printer, you probably have a software package that comes bundled with it that lets you do the slicing and send the commands to that particular device, okay? There uh, are third-party, third like, uh, uh, what's your name? Simplify 3D. And they have tons of post processors, and they'll write one for your machine if you get something that's strange. Okay. But uh, it turns out that all these guys are buying the same thing, almost cure up, and then modifying it and calling it theirs. Okay. Uh, I think I mentioned slicers are inherent in the way you generate a toolpath. Uh, one of the things that is just kind of a no by the way is that in the additive world there are an emerging set of tools to reverse engineer a real part as opposed to, to essentially rebuild a solid model and they range from uh, fancy scanners that you could make a digital picture <coughs> of the blimp hanger at Moffett Field to you know Scan this bearing and figure out, you know, how to reverse engineer. So that's just another piece of technology that is emerging. Okay, so resources to kind of leave you with. I mentioned Gerotic as kind of a special application. It's a device, or it's a software package designed specifically to uh, come up with gear change, and it's a relatively simple user interface. You just specify the specs and it'll produce a gear image and if you can add a shaft and another gear and you can build gear trains. Uh, one of the nice features it will also give you a solid model and a G-code out of it. Um, it's, I think it costs $200 for a lifetime license and you can use it for free just to play with it. Uh, you may or may not know that uh, Paul builds his flywheels using this tool because it allows you to generate interesting geometries for the spokes. You can just have radial spokes or you can have curl spokes. So he just uses that GCO generation, puts it on his mill to actually cut out the, the flywheels. He also so, cut the gear out with it so that uh, Johnson motor I have. Yeah. It, it also now will do uh, impellers for superchargers <laughs> and square gears. Oh yeah, and, and it does speed some 3D now. And you may remember when he was fiddling with magnetos, he made an elliptical gear that would give it a snap of the mm -hmm. uh, magneto to create the spark. I never saw an engine run, so it may not have been a success. It didn't work. Oh, no, it worked. Okay. Um, so, if you wanted an easy way to get your feet wet, you might look at that. Okay. Uh, the other big thing is community colleges these days have um, design manufacturing courses, the Anza and Cupertino and Chabot and Hayward. Um, and 
it migrated from the high school shop classes and mechanical drawing to now you can get skill certificates and they're really in business of, of giving people tools about to find a job. Uh, and then these days there's an online resource for just about everything imaginable. Uh, my word of caution is don't necessarily presume that crowdsourcing will converge towards technical accuracy on the internet. So use some judgment on what looks credible, but you know, manufacturers, for example, will have abundant tutorials, whether it's SolidWorks or Mastercam or, or Creo or whatever. Okay? Well, Libra is probably the cheapest thing for people like us. Okay, I think that's about all. That was just the recursive geometry I derived for the Turner's cube. So, mm -hmm. so, so here where it says Paul uses it for flywheels and spokes and grinds off gears. So, so does he generate a gear and then uh, it, it generates a solid model of the gear. Right. But why would he grind off? He, he wouldn't do that. He okay. Would just, Excellent. Basically, you design a gear with the addendum and the addendum equal. That would be one way to do it, yeah. What, what uh, Gerotico will do, is, or Gerotic, you can cut it with a milling cutter. If, if you know, the gear is big enough and the cutter is small enough, it will cut it with a, with a, uh, uh, a saw. Yeah. It'll, yeah. It'll, sure, sure. sure. And then uh, it will also then use, uh, you know, Standard old index, fourth axis indexing and cut it with, with sure. cutters. Sure. And it also will give you the shape of the cutter for that specific gear. So right. It's pretty, this is the guy that uh, was the author of Mach 3. Yeah, I, I played around with the, uh, you know, the trial uh, thing at one point. It's, it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, John Stevenson made, uh, I think it was a 20, a 21, and a 22 tooth gear, all with the same uh, 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 fish circle. Yeah. That would mesh and operate correctly. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm aware of the uh, uh, potentials. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no, it wasn't a question, it's just a, another piece of. Uh, software, which is Rhino, yeah. which is basically a design um, surface modeler, and that's something that we use all the time because we can slice, because most of our parts are real big, yeah. so we got to slice these things and build them up in layers, yeah. and uh, but I can, it's a really powerful pro program, it's not really geared to modeling like we know it, but you could do it with it. And it's it's an extremely powerful program and it's like eight hundred dollars and it's a bargain. I mean if you if you want to design a lot of organic kind of stuff, um, and you can design just anything. I mean <clears throat> we just hired a um, a guy at our shop. He's an expert at it and he designed this uh, electronic device that has, you know, multiple ports and everything with wires, and he was able to bend those wires, and it's it's just pretty incredible. So it's just another another piece of software. One of the things that that, that I've, I'm learning SolidWorks. I talked to Michael about it off and on, and. I'm finding that uh, in learning that, building the tool that I've, I've got a set of drawings for an engine, the Root and, uh, root and Van der Root engine, and I'm going to build one of these days. And I've, just, I've been drawing the whole thing up on SolidWorks, and just doing that, I'm sitting there thinking about the process of how to build each of those parts. So it, 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 nothing else, because I, I don't have any CNC equipment at all. I got all totally conventional equipment because of my age. <laughs> so, that's so what I learned on, that's what I'm going to use. Is that if you're working with a new software package and you say, gee, how do I do that? 
chances are good somebody else has asked the same question and it's built into the tool. It's just figuring out where in the menu structure do you find that particular yeah. tool. Well, it's been a good learning experience. So. But I mean, the, the key thing is that I'm seeing in it is that I'm thinking through the process of building the parts as I go through it. Yeah, it's all in the setup. Yeah. Okay. okay.